And uh, what else? Um, oh, of course, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the talk uh, verbally. Um, and with that, we're very excited to have Eduardo Oregon Race um, here to tell us a, a third lecture on cumulated groups and virtual specialists. So whenever you're ready. Uh, thanks, Raleigh. OK, uh, please, in case to hear some background names during these first few minutes, please. For this me, this will end at some point, hopefully soon. Uh, so let me start with uh, this last lecture, which is, I mean, we want to use all what we learn about key-related groups and virtually special groups and apply this to uh, uh, hyperbolic groups. So just a review of what we saw last time. So last time we talked about separability and residual finiteness, which is a desired condition for groups and for subgroups, but that uh, is a priori not related to uh, cumulations, but it's connected when we talk about this uh, really nice subclass of cumulative groups, which are the virtually special groups. And the way it's related, it's via this construction coming from this, uh, I mean, this cubical machinery coming from this nice behavior of walls, which is the canonical completion and reduction. And with this, we show that um, convex subgroups are virtual retracts and hence separable. Uh, and today, we want to apply all of these to hyperbolic groups. So first, we'll start with a review of hyperbolic groups, just a quick review, because we need to talk about quasi-convexity and the boundary at infinity. Then we'll continue with something that maybe I should have discussed in previous lectures, but I think it's fine if we do it today, which is ways of cumulating groups. Uh, and we do it today because I, I mean, I want a specific statement and I want quick consequences, but at the end, the, the moral level of this is we want to uh, see some I mean, flavor of the Gibbs construct, which is actually the way in which we cumulate groups that are not necessarily hyperbolic. And then we want to use all of these to conclude things and, I mean, get nice examples of cumulated virtual special groups, which comes from the wise quasi convex hierarchy theorem and from A equals theorem. And these theorems apply to hyperbolic groups. And in case there is time, I think there won't be enough time, but just in case, to we'll see something about the relatively hyperbolic case. Before we continue, just a um, warning. Today, we won't discuss the malnormal special quotient theorem, which is pretty sad. I mean, it's a kind of ten a technical statement, but it's kind of like the flavor of uh, the theory of cubulated hyperbolic groups. I mean, both the results are proven using the malnormal special quotient theorem and generalizations of this result or maybe variations of this are actually available uh, by some form of the malnormal special quotient theorem. Another thing I won't discuss today is, in terms of the application, I won't discuss the virtual pipe. Which was a, another nice application when these, uh, I mean, these theorems uh, were proven. Okay, so I won't discuss this. So let's see, okay, and some references in case you are interested in seeing the details. Uh, so finally, uh, why is long manuscript about uh, the quasi commons hierarchy theorem has been published. So yay, after kind of 10 years. So this is uh, great news. And uh, also again, Shepard's notes on the Eagle theorem, uh, which are pretty readable uh, and I mean, the Groups are technical, but they are readable. I mean, when compared to the, I mean, how powerful these theorem is. Also about cumulations, uh, I recommend the Gibbs notes. Uh, I mean, probably I think the first two chapters are about just cumulating groups and how the, I mean, this machinery can get done. And I won't give any formality on Sagib's construction, but I try to give you a flavor on how this works here with at least one example. Uh, okay, so that being said, let's start with the review. So hyperbolic groups. So Macarena, uh, 
have talked about hyperbolic groups, and I also have talked about hyperbolic groups, but we have solid definition, and sometimes we talk about uh, some notions related to this, and just to be on the same page, I uh, highlight some of the main points of these groups, and in any case, there are a bunch of references I just, uh, like you mentioned, for some high figures group, but there are lots, a lot of uh, literature about hyperbolic groups. And what is the idea of hyperbolic group? It's a group in which essentially the triangles uh, look like this. So each time we have three points, I mean, we consider any Cayley graph. I mean, some good news about hyperbolic group is that everything we do uh, is essentially independent on the Cayley graph we choose. So what, what happens is that each time we have three points, we uh, x, y, and z. So we join x, y, and y, and z. And the point is that the third geodesic the one joining X and Z must be close to the union of the other two. That means it lies in the delta neighborhood of the union of these two years, which is a pretty thing. Uh, and this definition is really useful. And at the end, this is a kind of generalization of what happens for trees. So you should consider hyperbolic group, hyperbolic groups from a course point of view as generalizations of free groups. So obviously free groups must be hyperbolic, and also groups which uh, look like hyper, uh, like free groups in the sense that they have few relators, most of them will be hyperbolic. So I won't state the, when, uh, state the correct uh, notions of small cancellation, but uh, usually small cancellation groups with the appropriate uh, small cancellation condition will be hyperbolic. Also one relator groups with torsion are hyperbolic, so Macarena mentioned that, I mean, there's a kind of dichotomy on the well-behaved one related groups torsion and the full generality of one related groups. And one of the reasons is that one related groups with torsion are hyperbolic. So from this point of view, they are well-behaved. Uh, but also hyperbolic groups or hyperbolic spaces are, I mean, gram of hyperbolicity is a generalization of what we see in the usual Riemannian hyperbolic space or hyperbolic plane. So of course, the by one of a closed hyperbolic manifold should be hyperbolic too. And well, in case we're not happy, I mean, we have combinatorial hyperbolic groups, we have geometric hyperbolic groups, but the point is that essentially if we pick a, a group at random, I mean, according to the density model, if this group is infinite, then this group will be hyperbolic. And because for density more than a half, this group is, I mean, almost trivial. So you should, you should think of hyperbolic groups as uh, the generic case for finally presented groups. Uh, so what else? Okay, we need quasi-convexity. So quasi-convexity is the notion of nice subgroups of hyperbolic groups. So if you have a hyperbolic group, quasi-convexity, a, a way to define this is we consider a finally generated subgroup, which is quasi-symmetrically embedded. So this map is not, of course, we don't expect this map to be, I mean, with quasi-dense image, but it's quasi-symmetrically embedded. That means the geometry, I mean, the geometry of the Cayley graph of H looks like the geometry of H as a subset of this Cayley graph. And an examples of uh, quasi-convex subgroups, so we have that every finally generated subgroup of a free group is uh, quasi convex, which is nice. We also have that each time we have a hyperbolic group, any cyclic subgroup will be quasi convex. This is because these subgroups define at the end quasi geodesics, I mean the orbits. And also, the, the idea that we should have in mind is that each time we have a closed hyperbolic free manifold, we take the fundamental group, then the fundamental group of a totally geodesic sub manifold will be quasi convex. And here we can relax being hyperbolic by having negative curvature. And here you can relax being totally geodesic by being, I mean, almost totally geodesic or some similar notion. And, okay, so we have hyperbolic groups, these nice subgroups, and we need to talk about the boundary. Ariana asks yeah. for, for non-examples. Oh, for non-examples. Uh, you pick a hyperbolic group. Each time you have a normal subgroup that is infinite and of infinite index, this group won't be quasi-complex. 
An example of this is if you have a closed hyperbolic three manifold, take the fundamental group. If these three manifold fibers over the circle, you take the normal subgroup corresponding to the fiber, which is a surface group, which is really nice. It's still hyperbolic, but it's not quasi complex. And so even we have hyperbolic subgroups that are non quasi complex. And okay, so that being said, we need to talk about the boundary. So what is the boundary? And I won't give you the um, informal definition. I mean, there are lots of equivalent definitions. But the point is that we want to codify the directions of infinity. So let's think of this as being uh, the Kelly graph. I mean, I mark the vertices. And what's going on is that we want to take geodesics. And we want to see where we get. And there's a space of directions. Uh, the point is that, I mean, usually the Kelly graphs are non um, um, uniquely geodesic. So maybe this geodesic, of course, is not the same as this one. But at the end, these two geodesic define the same direction. And I mean, of course, you can define this for any space with geodesics. But the point is that this. Boundary has a really, really nice topology, and the topology comes from this assumption of hyperbolicity. So, this space is naturally a compact space with a metric. This metric is non canonical, but the topology is canonical, and indeed, this is a quasi isometric invariant for the hyperbolic. So, if you have, you have two hyperbolic groups that are quasi isometric, then the room of boundaries will be homomorphic, which is pretty nice. And and examples of this. So uh, I didn't give you the formal definition, but what you should have in mind is that the chroma boundary is I mean, what it should be. Um, if you have a picture in mind of your hyperbolic group, then usually you have a picture of what the boundary is, and this is what you get. For example, in the trivial case, we have the integers, I mean, of the of two directions at infinity. So the boundary should be just points. In the case of the groups, we have that these two groups are geometrically on trees, and the directions of trees are given by the counter sets. And in the case of closed harmonic manifolds, these I mean these groups act geometrically on hyperbolic space, and it doesn't matter the, the model you choose for hyperbolic space. At the end, the compactification at infinity is given by sphere. So the point is that. The boundary is just that. In case you want to know more about boundaries, I always recommend this uh, survey from Kapovich, um, which is really nice. And, okay, so some final remarks is that each time you have a hyperbolic group, and they would, I mean, a nice feature is that this group acts on its boundary naturally. And, and this action is by common orders. So you imagine you have a surface group that acts geometrically on H2. And I mean, at the end, it acts by Mobius transformations and Mobius transformations and I mean, extend to the boundary. So that is the idea. And another remark is that each time you have a quasi convex subgroup, it behaves nicely with respect to the boundary in the sense that first of all, quasi convex subgroups are always hyperbolic. And second, that uh, the boundary embeds into the boundary of the n. So we have always n. And so this is nice. Is there any question at this point? So I know this is just a quick review and hoping that the ideas are clear. I think. We are, we just need the general picture of what a hyperbolic group is. Okay, so let's continue. So we want to cumulate hyperbolic groups, and indeed we want to cumulate in groups in general. So we'll see applications for hyperbolic groups, but the moral of this is that we can do this for any finally generated group as long as we have a nice subgroup. 
And what is the notion of nice subgroup here is the notion of co-dimension ones. So if you have a group G that is not necessarily hyperbolic, but let's say finally generated, a subgroup is co-dimension one if you will take the Kelly graph of G, any Kelly graph, and we mod this by the action of um, H, which is the, let's call the Schroeder graph. And we still, I mean, this question is, is still a graph, and we count the number of points. And we need in uh, this graph to have more than one. So um, this graph has. Uh, okay, so since I am a hyperbolic person, the way I think of uh, co dimension one sub is always, I mean, coming from, I mean, if my group comes from a manifold, then the co dimension one sub comes from a co dimension one sub. And, but of course, it applies for any kind of geometry. So if you are in Rn, co dimension one means Rn minus one. So the first example we should have in mind is that Zn is co-dimension one in, in Cn plus one. And another picture we should have in mind is that surface groups are dimension two, co-dimension one means cyclic, so cyclic groups of surface groups are co-dimension one. And also in the idea of this picture, we have that in as it convex in surface. So fundamental groups of those. So maybe here I'm lying, maybe here I'm not being really specific. Maybe we need some condition for this to be, uh, I mean, some notion is subject to being two-sided, but in any case, morally, uh, being a quasi-convex surface subgroup means being dimension one. And so why we need for dimension one subgroups is because, I mean, they are, um, they are intimately related to accumulation via this Sagib's uh, idea, but I'll, and just state this as a theorem in terms of a criterion of very and wise. So we suppose that this is a hyperbolic group and we want to accumulate. And we suppose that for any points in the boundary, there is a subgroup which is quasi convex. What I mentioned one. Such that the boundary of this subgroup separates in P and Q. That means P and Q in different points. This complement. So if this holds for any pair of different points then this means that we can cumulate the group. Okay, so this means, so in this picture, if you have points, let's say P and Q. So in this case, these two points are separated by this uh, quasi-convex subgroup, but if now the prime is here, then maybe we are able to find another Quasi convex and it's called for any. Is this an if and only if statement? Uh, assuming the group is hyperbolic. So, assume it's hyperbolic, is it an if and only if? And you will label um, it's kind of, I mean, it's um, walls are, I mean, walls are related to side for anything. Okay. Um, Sorry, what did you say? I didn't hear. Walls oh, or what? Mean, I mean, wall stabilizers are for dimension one. So I should say that secretly, yes. So each time, even if you have a cumulated group, 
if it's a wall stabilizer, this wall stabilizer will be co dimension one. Uh, and I guess that for hyperbolic groups, the answer could be yes or morally yes, because the action, I mean, you have a wall stabilizer and you pick a, um, and you conjugate, you get a new wall stabilizer, and the action of the group on the boundary is nice enough so that usually you can separate them. So this is this in the accord in the hyperbolic. But of course, of course, for this statement, we need hyperbolic simplicity to talk about. Thank you. Okay, so I want to give you an idea of the group. So, uh, I mean, in this statement, the good point is that I, mean, I can draw the boundary, so I can the pictures, but the lesson from this statement, I mean, of the proof is the Gibbs construction, which works for each time we have, uh, I mean, enough co-dimension one subgroups that are not necessarily to convex, and I then don't necessarily come from hyperbolic. So what is the idea? The idea is that if you have co-dimension and one subgroups, okay, at this point, I mean, each pair gives us a, a co-dimension one subgroup satisfying this condition, but the point is that we can actually reduce our family and say that this I mentioned one subgroup come from just finally many classes. So we can find finally many legacy classes. I mentioned one subgroups and still separating. Okay, and here we're using that the action uh, of the group on its boundary is uh, nice enough. So this, I think it's nice enough so that we can reduce in this case to this situation. And usually this is the situation where we start cumulating. So you have I mean, given conjugacy classes of co-dimension one subgroups. What these subgroups do is that these groups kind of um, give um, Notion of pulp space. So this one subgroups the pulp spaces. So in this picture, I mean each color represents a given conjugacy class. So you can imagine this is a surface group, and these are co-dimension one subgroups. And what we do is that each cosy convex subgroup, at least in this picture, represents two half spaces. So this one, for example, represents this half space and this other half space. And in the general situation, I mean, uh, half spaces are represented by ends in the trailer graph. And there's, there are not necessarily two of them, but usually we just need I mean, to pick two of them. I won't say at random, but I mean, there are some non-canonical choices in the general case. And we use these half spaces to cube. So what we do, we will relate a vertex in a cube complex for each some, uh, somehow minimal intersection of half space. So that means in, in this picture, uh, minimal intersection is represented by a region. So for this region, we have a vertex. For this other region, we have another vertex, and, and so on. And so in the general case, we must be careful because, I mean, the, it's not like we can intersect all spaces because they are not really there. They represent just ends, so there's some formality which is related to, I mean, but the idea is still the same. Uh, and the point is, okay, we have the zero skeleton, so how we construct edges. So edges will be given by intersections. So these two vertices are intersections.
and if these two intersections differ by one choice of pulse space, then they are dynamic. By exactly. So what do we mean by this? So for this region, the difference of this region and this region for B and W is that for this quasi-convex subgroup, for one we choose one pulse space and for the other vertex we choose the other one. So that means since this is the only difference that these two uh, vertices are going to damage. In this picture, at the end, we should get this answer like this. Um, what else? Okay, so we can believe that if we do this right, we get, I mean, just at this point, we just get a graph. And okay, what we do with this graph, we complete accordingly. So each time, which this is something that there's a, a square, then it's bigger. And a square is related to four cycles. So for example, a square, so let's say here, it's not example. This is what it is. So squares are related to four cycles. And so on. So, for example, if you see a bunch of squares and the pattern is like the boundary of a three cube, then we fill with a three cube. So, for example, here we have squares. Mm, well, and you can continue. And what is the point of this is that by the magic of co dimension one subgroups, if you do this uh, carefully, Sagis construction always gives us um, cat zero differences. X is cat zero. Uh, and this is not that surprising as long as we can fill with cubes, because I mean, uh, I think we need to get that the two skeleton is simply connected. And as long as it's simply connected, then we can, I mean, in the only way we glue, I mean, we, we attach higher dimensional cubes, then we get something that is catchy. And, and the point is that since at the beginning, we started with conjugacy classes of dimension one subgroups, then there's an action, I mean, on the half spaces, and there is also an action then on the vertices of this category complex. And I mean, essentially there's a, an action that, we can, that can be extended to the whole category. And this is where we stop in general for a Gibbs construction. And if you want to get extra properties for this action, then we need extra properties for it. So in this case, properness depends on our boundary conditions. So maybe that's something. At this point, we remember that all of these came from assumptions on separating points on the boundary. And for compactness, will come from quasi convexity of the co dimension concept. And that's it. Of course, there are a lot of non-canonical choices here. So usually the key relation we get is non-canonical. Uh, and the point is that uh, all of this might seem like a black box and probably I should say that properness is a black box. There's a lot of work to be done there, but what you should have to believe is that quasi-convexity is usually easy to get as long as we are in the hyperbolic setting and we are dealing with quasi complex So this is usual for hyperbolic groups. So properness is not that easy, but quasi convexity, sorry, co-compactness is not that hard to get in the hyperbolic setting. In any case, co-compactness is usually hard to verify in non-hyperbolic settings, but there are some cases in which that can happen. And so I hope this is, I mean, the, the flavor of the same construction is um, understood. So we have- Sorry, so, so you, you yeah. said like 
you you said that properness comes from uh, yeah comes from uh, the boundary assumption and uh, mm -hmm. co compactness comes from quasi convexity. So if you have only the boundary assumption, you always get like a tubulation that you act on, but not go compactly. Oh, but, um... but then what does it mean to only have the boundary assumption? Because the boundary assumption had quasi convexity in, in it. Uh, oh yeah, of course. I mean, what I mean by this is that, I mean, in general, we, we get co-compactness if we start with co-dimension one quasi convex subgroups. But what I mean is that I mean, we have this statement with this condition is that it's because this is the condition that ensures properness. You mean that every two points are separated by a, by a wall, right? That's the condition uh, that you mean by the, for the boundary. Uh, kind of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And since, I mean, the action is nice enough, I mean, this condition is enough to guarantee properness in the sense of you have, I mean, uh, an element in the room tending to infinity, then the number of walls separating will also tend to infinity. At the end, this is the Thank you. Yeah, I mean, but in the really general case, I mean, usually we stop here and there's some extra work to be done in each case. In this case, since we are in a hyperbolic group and our statement comes from some boundary assumptions, we get properness and bulk of compactness is usually easy to verify as long as we are dealing with quasi-convex co-dimension ones. Okay, uh, okay, so just a summary of what we do mm, for, for Salipsic construction. So we have co-dimension one subgroups. These co-dimension one subgroups uh, up to some choices determine all spaces. And we want to consider vertices of for cube complex as intersections of um, half space morally. I mean the formal construction is not related to this, it's related to um, some notion of um, ultra filters, but we believe this is the the idea we want to to express. And then uh, if I mean there's just one difference in the choices of half spaces, then these two vertices are joined by an edge and then we complete. And we'll get something that's it. And okay. So have this statement, and we want to prove tubulation of this. So some consequences of Verger and Weiss criterion or Sagib's construction, or variation of this Verger and Weiss construction for groups that are non necessarily hyperbolic. So from this, we can cubulate, and here cubulate means. Uh, getting a proper and co-compaction. So we have by merger on Weiss plus Kana Markovich, we can cumulate by one of the close hyperbolic manifold. Okay, and why is this? This is because Kana Markovich produced in a bunch of almost totally geodesic immersed surfaces inside in a closed free manifold. I mean, this is just hyperbolic geometry. I think they use uh, the, um, some ergodicity properties of the frame flow. I mean, this is actually just hyperbolic geometry, but the conclusion is that from this plus this Fredon and Weiss criterion, we can cumulate this. And also, Hagen and Weiss found enough in co-dimension one quasi convex subgroups for the hyperbolic three by cyclic groups. And, and this, I mean, this is quite, I mean, there are two papers related to this, and they are quite long papers, but you can keep with it. I mean, I mean, even the task of finding quasi convex co dimension one. Subgroups is not easy at all. Um, also, variation of all of these the groups that are not necessarily hyperbolic are given by Weiss and then further. Um, and so this is for by one of plus hyperbolic. Okay, and then 
and this group is usually, I mean, this group is non-hyperbolic, but hyperbolic relative to um, abelian groups. And similarly, by a lot of people, at the end, a bunch of papers can be reduced to knowing that mixed through many folds have cumulative in fundamental groups. And here, a warning because some of these cumulations, I mean, will be proper always, but the action is not necessarily co compact. So this is um, not always co compact. Okay, and at this point, I think there is a characterization of when this gives co compact action. And I mean, the, con I mean, the characterization is not really clear topologically, the condition is kind of complicated, but you know it. Uh, and also from just a cubical perspective, we have a combination theorem from Martin and Steamboat. And they prove that a small cancellation of the free product And this is also key. And so this is a kind of nice result. That means we can construct um, key related groups, I mean, new key related groups from old ones. And, and this uses not only the idea of co dimension one subgroups, but it uses the idea that uh, other things. So they construct this, actually this is called a wall space structure, which is the formality of this idea of half spaces. And these half spaces, not, not, not all of them come from what's in two dimension one side. And in any case, the question of cumulating groups is still hard because finding two dimension one subgroups is hard. So for example, can we cumulate Fundamental group of a closed hyperbolic four manifold. And this is not known in anything else. I mean, it's not clear that we can find, in, I mean, inside a quasi convex subgroup that is fundamental group of a closed hyperbolic four manifold or something related. So finding Interesting subgroups is in general difficult. Is there a uniform bound on the, the dimension of accumulation of a hyperbolic three manifold group, for example? Mm. Um, Genevieve Walsh asks for um, a sequence of, of three manifolds such that the cubical dimension, the minimal cubical dimension goes to infinity. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I didn't know that answer, but I just know that there are three main, I mean, three many folds that are not homeomorphic to uh, three dimensional things. I mean, I mean, maybe an, an interesting question related to that is, is any close three many fold uh, virtually the, the fundamental group of a three dimensional cube complex? Uh, I mean, usually, the, I mean, the dimension is related to the intersection of these wall spaces. And in general, we need lots of subgroups. So it's not clear that, I mean, from this construction, we won't get any bounds. So I don't know if there's an upper bound on the, the dimension of a key deviation for three manifolds, but I think it's known that there are examples of cubiated groups whose cubical dimension is. Um, uh, differs from its cohomological dimension by as much as you want. Okay, yeah. I mean, usually, they, I mean, the cubical world is not the same as the usual CW complex world. I mean, <coughs> okay, so I mean, we can cube the groups. Um, 
probably in the or way of curating the most tracking result is the post-convex hierarchy theorem. Uh, and this applies usually this, we don't need to think of this as a theorem for a group, but for a class of groups, I explain nice properties. So I'll state the theorem in this way because I don't want to talk about the uh, graph of groups. So what is the idea here is that we have a group that is known to be hyperbolic. So this is relevant. And we have uh, two cases. So either the group is uh, an amalgamated free product or a HM extension. And we want the vertex groups to be uh, virtually special. We want the edge group to be quasi So quasi convex and uh, quasi convex in. Uh, and these two assumptions will imply that, first of all, the group G is cubulated, but not only cubulated, the group is equally special. Uh, and this is a really nice construction. And the way we should think of this is that this applies for groups in which you have a, a notion of I mean, for a class of groups in which you have a notion of complexity. So let's say the complexity runs from zero to infinity. And the idea is for complexity zero, groups, we know that these groups are hyperbolic for some trivial reasons. Maybe these groups are finite or free or virtually free. And the idea is you have a group of complexity n. We can prove that this group G of complexity n splits as a a free product or an HM extension. And what should happen is that the vertex group have domain have complexity less than n. So what happens in that case, by induction, the, this vertex group will be virtually special and by uh, this theorem, D will be also So this is the way in, we, in which we should think of this theorem. And this theorem is actually useful because this gives violations. Uh, but in any case, there are variations of these that call for groups that are not necessarily hyperbolic, but usually we need some notion at least relative hyperbolic. So some uh, classes of groups that can be curated in this way and proven to be virtually special are, uh, I mean, what given by twice. So the first example is in a class of fully residually free groups. So D is fully surely free if for any finite subset of D, there is a free portion. That means if R is free, that is injective uh, on this test. So this is the notion of um, fully visually free groups. And I mean, I'm not really familiar with the theory of these groups, but these groups are nice in the sense that these groups are, are hyperbolic relative to free abelian groups. And also that these groups have a nice part. In the sense that we have this notion of complexity and each time a uh, complexity ends up with it is the graph of groups of the vertex group uh, of uh, lower complexity. This is one example. And the other example is given by uh, one relator groups with torsion. So what is a one relator group with torsion? G run by a bunch of generators and a single relator, which is a non-trivial power. So K is greater than one. And I mean, we need R to be primitive and I mean, physically reduced and so on. But the point here that there's also a notion of complexity, which is given by uh, this presentation. And this gives something called the uh, Magnus hierarchy. And the point is that these groups uh, are cumulated by this 
Osicom is far with them, but moreover, they are virtually special. So as a corollary, we get that one related. Proportion are uh, usually fine. Uh, and you should believe me that this is a really non trivial result. I mean, this was a question by, uh, question by Pam's lab, which was open uh, for a long time. And this was proven by Wise using this theory of uh, special key complexes and this quasi complex part, which is. Uh, nice because I mean a priori there is no uh, cumulation assumption for defining quantilator groups with torsion, and there is no cumulation in the conclusion. And this is related to residual finiteness. So at the end, I mean if we push this, I mean the lesson is that if we push this problem to a cumulated world uh, and to the special few complexes, we get the result. I mean this is probably one of the reasons of why this. Theory of special key complexes attracted a lot of attention. Uh, in any case, these theorems are essentially for cumulating. I, I still see wise quasi complex orchid theorem as a way of cumulating groups, but I mean, this is not, I mean, this is not the case. This is also a proof for, I mean, a tool for proving virtual specialness once we know that a group is cumulated. And this was used by uh, Ian Eagle to prove that each time we have a cumulated group that is hyperbolic, this group is automatically different. So it's really nice that this uh, theorem is easy to state. I mean, as long as you have you know notation, hopefully we can understand the theorem. And the point is that I mean, I, mean, I think this theorem is interesting in the sense that I mean, cumulation or something is an action on a space I mean, as a combinatorial structure, but that is locally nice in the sense that in non possibility is local for each. I mean, it's a flat condition for each vertex, and being hyperbolic is a coarse condition. It depends on the large star geometry of it. And when we combine these two uh, properties, we get virtual specialness, that means we are uh, of a virtually subgroup of a right angle group, and we know. Bunch of nice consequences. So the first consequence that we should know is that I mean from this is that these groups are visually finite, which is really nice. Remember, it's still open of whether all hyperbolic groups are visually finite. So this implies that the class of hyperbolic cumulative groups is a really nice class, uh, and we saw that this is a really rich class of hyperbolic groups that are visually finite. And also, uh, recall that hyperbolic cumulative for hyperbolic cumulative groups being in convex in terms of the cumulative structure is the same as being quasi convex in terms of chroma hyperbolicity. So this implies that quasi convex groups are separate. Um, which is sometimes enough for getting a uh, really, really strong, strong conclusion. So just 20 seconds for talking about the proof of this result. This result uses wise quasi convex hierarchy theorem, but in the opposite way. So, uh, I mean, also up to a lot of machinery, but what's going on is that we, the, the idea is we're going in the opposite way, that means we have this quotient with complex, and we kind of cut the, uh, this complex along walls, and we obtain just um, simply connected smaller pieces. Actually, uh, you can find trigger groups. And the way is that there's a way to glue these pieces together inductively. And each time we get something that is, first of all, hyperbolic, and then by the quasi complex hierarchy theorem, virtually. Uh, now at the end, we get that the final piece is not the original one, but it's a finite cubic cover of what we got. And by the, and this hierarchy theorem, we get a um, finite index of what we that is. So it goes in the other way, which is 
why the proof is in any case, um, we still have some time to see an application of all of these, which is similar to the one related case. And a priori, we don't have simulation assumption on the nature of the groups nor on the conclusion. So this is a solution for the virtual hacking conjecture, the hyperbolic case, which was the remaining case. So this is a theorem for general hyperbolic manifolds that are irreducible, and I think we need um, anything fundamental. And I don't remember the full statement, but in any case, in the hyperbolic case, and, and this can be written as follows. So if you have a closed hyperbolic tree manifold, then we want to find a finite GD cover containing a surface which is pi one injected. And containing means uh, embedded. And this is relevant. I mean, these manifolds are called Hacken. And the point is that if we cut along the surface, we get new three manifolds that are Hacken. We can cut again. And at the end, we can kind of um, recover these three manifolds as uh, gluing simple pieces. Is somehow the idea we think about surfaces when we cut along uh, a central surface. This is, this is a three manifold version of that. And, but getting something that is embedded is hard. Uh, but I mean, we saw yesterday that this can be achieved by having separability. So, how this works? So, by Kana Markovich. And what we have, we have what they are in the mirrors. I want to get to surface. surfaces in this way. And again, this is enough to show that this uh, subgroup embeds in the fundamental group and this quasi -comics. Uh, and from this, what we should, what we want, we want this quasi-convex subgroup to be uh, separable. So we use a wall theorem, and we deduce that this subgroup is separable. Okay, and this resumes the this long path. So first we we show that this group is cumulated, then we prove that this group is virtually special, and then Virtual specialness gives us separability of quasi complex So this subgroup is separable. And once we get this, we apply squats between. So we can promote this immersion to an embedding in a finite GDP. So this theorem looks trivial once we know this, and this is highly non trivial. So this is the way this theorem was proven. And so I still have time for another consequence, <coughs> which is a, of more abstract nature, but is somehow related. So the question is. I mean, we have a hyperbolic group and we have boundary. I mean, it's not a boundary. And the question is, um, how much do we know about the group if we just know the boundary? So for example, if the boundary is a counter set, then we know that the hyperbolic group is virtually free. By a highly non-trivial theorem, we know that if the boundary is uh, S1, then the group is virtually a surface group. This is a theorem due to uh, Tyson, John Grace, and Gabay using some results of Tokyo. Uh, and the question is what happens in higher dimensions? So, for dimensions for a higher, I mean, it's not clear what to expect because, I mean, uh, fundamental groups of uh, spherical manifolds of higher dimension are non well behaved, but in dimension three, have the in 
in three manifolds and somehow in that spirit is expected. So what is expected is that if you have a hyperbolic group with boundary the two sphere, then morally the group is Kleinian group. And what we expect is that there is a finite index subgroup such that this group is the fundamental group of a closed hyperbolic manifold. This is Kant's conjecture, and uh, yeah, this way of finding, I mean, of having a separable quasi convex subgroup, uh, Markovich and also Helsinki independently proved that in the key related case, uh, this is true. Sorry, you mentioned if the boundary is S1, then you must be as virtual as surface group. Does that assume cubable or it doesn't? It doesn't because it's implied by having the boundaries. Uh, indeed, this is one of the exercises for cosmology. I mean, Bergeron wise implies he will appear. Uh, but that is not true if the boundary is S2, because in general, we don't have nice, I mean, we want surface groups inside, and that is you know, open. So, what is expected for this conjecture, or what is the goal? We want to, or either Probability by some other methods, or we want to remove this one, maybe get this result by not assuming probability. So the goal is to keep this or remove this. And this is the general canon. Uh, in any case, it seems that the algebra way to prove this theorem, even cumulative or not, is related to finding nice subgroups. So the question here is. A question of drama. Um, so if the hyperbolic and one ended, meaning that the boundary is connected, and does be contain a surface group. Not even because it's just a surface. Uh, and probably no one has any one up to this point. I mean, even in the QLA case. So, what if this QLA Even in that case, there's no idea. And in any case, uh, something is known. I think for some models of random groups, uh, we can find uh, lots and lots of, I mean, generally we find uh, surface subgroups for random hyperbolic, I mean, for random groups. But I mean, um, anyway, I mean, the question of finding nice subgroups is, is far from the And But in the case, so I think, um, out of time, so 